talk to me or email me or whatever, and we will make sure that it gets put in our weekly emails. Now, our weekly emails, if you want one of those and you aren't on our email list, you talk to Norm, who's in the blue shirt near the back. And um, we also want to remind you of a couple of things. We are a family, and the people and things that you celebrate and pray for are important to all of us. So no matter how small, please feel free to share. And secondly, when you submit a prayer request, that's not the end of it. You've started this process, and, and it would be really helpful if you would keep us updated on the situation so that we know what's going on. And it's not easy to remember that sometimes, so we might remind you, hey, what's going on with this? But please try to remember to keep in touch and, and let us know what's going on. Okay, prayer. Oh, we have other um, announcements that you'll find on the back of your bulletin. Things like our Wednesday Bible study, um, and our choir rehearsal. The choir sounded great this morning, I think, and if you would like to join them, all you have to do is show up at choir rehearsal on Friday morning at 9.30 right here. And we also want to announce our new LIT class. LIT stands for Lakeside Institute of Theology. We have a seminary, basically. It's a place where you can just learn and grow, or you could take classes for credit and end up with a master's degree or a diploma. So the new class is starting on June 21 at 9 a.m. It's a Tuesdays. It's going to be going on Tuesdays for eight consecutive weeks, and we'll tell you more about it. But it's a New, new Testament survey class. So please keep that in mind as you're planning your calendar. We have um, flowers given anonymously to the glory of God today, and they're gorgeous, as always. We have a coffee hour after church today, and that's a great place to meet people and to mingle and to catch up on what's been going on the last week, so I hope you'll join us there. I have one more question for you. Is anyone going to the United States this week who can take mail? Anyone, anyone? because there is mail to be taken. Okay, doesn't look that way. So that, oh, you are, okay, great. Right in the middle of the back there. Thank you, I appreciate that. We are here, yes, I, I see that. I'm not going to run down and give her this right now though. That'll come later. Okay, so now let's get into why we're really here, which is to worship the Lord. And let's begin with our prayer of invocation and adoration. Please pray with me. Everlasting Father, you are holy, eternal, and almighty. Yet in your tender love for the frail human race, you sent your Son to take our nature and to suffer death upon the cross. We praise you, O God, for your creation of the world, for the redemption that you provided through Jesus, and for the fact that you alone are holy and worthy of praise. We pray that we may follow your Son Jesus in the way of the cross, and that dying and rising with him, we may enter into your kingdom. Dear Lord, mercifully grant that in all things your Holy Spirit may direct and rule our hearts. Even now, we pray that you would make your presence here known, and that you might prepare us for worship as in a moment of silence, we turn our hearts toward you. We know, Father, that you love us and that Jesus Christ, our Lord, is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. In your mercy, enable us to share in his obedience to your will and in the glorious victory of his resurrection even as we express our love for you in this time of worship. For we pray all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Our scriptural call to worship this morning is from Psalm 32, verse 11. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing all you who are upright in heart. So let's stand and begin singing our first song of worship and praise. Bright and 
for the responsive reading. Good morning. Uh, please join me in the bold-faced type. The, today's responsive reading is from Psalm 97. The Lord reigns, let the earth be glad. Let the distant shores rejoice. Fire goes before him and consumes his foes on every side. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. All who worship images are put to shame. Those who boast in idols, worship him, all you gods. For you, Lord, are the most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. Light shines on the righteous and joy upon the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you who are righteous, and praise his holy name. You may be seated. Our first reading this morning is Acts from, from chapter 16 of Acts. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left her. When her owners realized that the hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. 
The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was, the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we're all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke of the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds, and then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. This is the word of the Lord. You may remain seated for our next song. Thank you. second reading is from Revelation chapter 22. Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come, let the one who is thirsty come, and the, let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this scroll, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add that to, to that person, the plagues described in this scroll. 
And if anyone takes words away from the scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share of the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in the scroll. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Now please stand for a reading of the gospel. A reading from the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. I pray for these men, but I am also praying for all people who will believe in me because of the teaching of these men. Father, I pray that all people who believe in me can be one. You are in me and I am in you. I pray that these people can also be one in us so that the world will believe that you sent me. I have given these people the glory that you gave me. I gave them this glory so that they can be one, the same as you and I are one. I will be in them, and you will be in me, so they will be completely one. Then the world will know that you sent me, and the world will know that you loved these people the same as you loved me. Father, I want these people that you have given me to be with me in every place I am. I want them to see my glory. This is the glory you gave me because you loved me before the world was made. Father, you are the one who is good. The world does not know you, but I know you. And these people know that you sent me. I showed them what you are like, and again, I will show them what you are like. Then they will have the same love that you have for me, and I will live in them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Before we get into our pastoral prayer, I want to um, announce something else. We uh, have a very close um, place in our heart for our prison ministry in this church, and Rebecca, who just read, is part of that, and um, as is Carla. They go visit the women's prison at least twice a month, I think, right? So um, there is a young woman there, Erica, who is hopefully going to be released, but she needs our help. And if you've ever wanted to be involved in prison ministry, now you can. We are um, initiating a letter writing campaign. It can be done online, I believe, right? And it can be done in English or in Spanish, but we need people to participate in that. And if you are willing to do that, and I don't think it should be a big effort, please see Rebecca and find out more details about that. Thank you. And now, let's join in prayer, giving thanks and asking favor on our church, our world, our neighbors, and ourselves. Please pray with me. Almighty God, the Holy and Worthy One, in Jesus Christ you taught us to pray and to offer our petitions to you in his name. Guide us by your Holy Spirit that our prayers for others may serve your will and show your steadfast love through Jesus Christ our Lord. We accept, gracious Father, that you have called us to be the church, the very body of your Son, Jesus. We ask that you keep all of us who proclaim faith in Christ in unity as one, that together we may more effectively proclaim the good news to the world, that all who hear may know that you are love and turn to you and your Son, Jesus. We pray especially, Father, for unity among those who call on the name of Jesus here at Lakeside. We pray for each of the churches in our community, asking that you would provide energy and vision to their leadership and encouragement and enthusiasm to their congregation and blessings on all the efforts they put forth in your name. And for Lakeside Presbyterian Church, our gathering here, Lord, I am so grateful that you have called such a wonderful and committed group together in one place. Give us wisdom to continually seek you, Lord. Beyond this, we ask only that what we say and do might bring you glory, for we know that if you are glorified in our midst, Lord, all else will be as it should be. Oh God, we cannot truly love you unless we have learned to love our neighbors, so remove hate and prejudice from us, we pray. May all your children be reconciled and live together in your peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
And most merciful God, we know that in Jesus you suffered all the pain and grief that we now experience in this life. So we ask you to look with special compassion on those who are sick, in pain, and at the point of death in our community. We pray especially for Sherry, for Alfonso and Sarai, for Brad, for Sabrina, for Dee, for Jody, for Candy, Killeen, Barbara, Donna, and Vanessa. And Father, we praise you for the answers to prayers for Karen, for Cheryl and Irene, for Susan and for Sabrina. Thank you, Lord, for those blessings. Cheer these, our brothers and sisters, by your word, bringing healing as a sign of your grace. And show all of us more clearly how we can be the instruments of your love and grace to these and others in our community who are suffering. Almighty God, whose word we trust and whose spirit enables us to pray, please accept these, our requests. And as we pray, may your will be made clear to us, and may you be glorified. Now, Father, in this faith, we pray together the prayer your son Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now please stand and sing our next hymn. something special for you today. It's the fifth Sunday of the month, and when we have a month with five Sundays, we have a special guest give the message. We've had this happen with Lynn Hansen and with Veronica's in the back, and um, I'm trying to think. Oh, Elise. Elise also <laughs> gave us uh, one of these fifth Sunday presentations, and today we have Jody Faulkner, who just started attending our church this year, and is a um, an ordained minister, and we're very happy to have her come talk to us today. So, Thank you, Carolyn. I want to thank Pastor Wayne and Pastor Carolyn and the rest of the leadership for giving me this privilege of being here and this honor this morning. I will tell you, my husband is in the States for work, and he's been sending me 
encouraging and maybe not encouraging text this morning. And so he just said, Jody, mas despacio, mas despacio. So if any of you have heard me speak, you understand why he's saying that. So, um, so I will work really hard on speaking more slowly. So um, I just never take this for granted that I get to do this. Today, I'd kind of like to just share some of my story with you and, uh, and just share what I feel like God put on my heart. 27 years ago this week, my life radically changed. I met a woman who had something that I knew that I did not have. She had peace, she had joy, she had love, and I knew I did not have all of those things in the same way that she had them. She just radiated this peace and this joy. And I just wanted to know what it was that she had and how you get it. And so I started hanging around her and uh, just wanting to soak that in. So she invited me to church. And so we started going to this little Baptist church out in the middle of a cornfield in southern Illinois. You had to literally turn left at the cornfield. There wasn't a road sign. And so I'm well suited for driving in Mexico. Um, So after a few months, we decided we wanted to join this church. So my husband and I were in a room with some Baptist deacons who wanted to know why it is that we wanted to join the church. And they wanted to kind of know our story. We had two small children at the time. They're still very small children because I'm not old. Um, And so my husband had a good Baptist pedigree. He had been saved in a Baptist church when he was eight years old and baptized and done things all the right way. My own story was a little shakier. They asked me when I had been saved, and I said, saved from what? So they rephrased it so this heathen could understand. When did you become a Christian? I've always believed in God. I went to church with my mother from the time I was very little. So I said, I've always been a Christian. At that point, some of the deacons began praying quietly. Um, So even in my apparently little unsaved brain, I knew this was not a good sign. So I also kind of knew I was failing this class and I've never failed a class. So they dumbed it down even further. If you died in a car wreck on the way home tonight, would you go to heaven or hell? And I said, you can't know that. At that point, there was more praying, and some of the men were now on their knees, audibly praying. On that night, which was May 31, 1995, I prayed the prayer of the good news of the gospel of Christ, and I asked him to be my Lord and my Savior. And I've spent the last 27 years, coming this Tuesday, uh, doing my best to serve him. I've served as the oldest church intern on record between Bible college and seminary, not even kidding. Um, As an entrepreneur, I've been a small group leader, I've been the head of a Bible college, I've been a school principal, I've been a middle school teacher, and I've served as a pastor. None of those callings or vocations are any higher than any other, and Jesus has used all of them in my life, and I hope in others' lives. So now I stand here incredibly honored to share with you in the mountains of Mexico, where I never knew that I would be. In fact, on this day last year, we were here for our very first visit, and here we is. So, um, and I'm so happy about it. On Good Friday, during our Tenebrae service here at Lakeside Presbyterian, I read a short poem. It's actually a song, and I have not been able to get it out of my mind. So when the leadership team asked if I would be willing to share, that poem just kept coming up and up in my brain. So I'm going to read it for you once again. It's called Barabbas by Eldred Hill. I lived 2,000 years ago. A thief, a rebel, was I. My name is Barabbas, and I was condemned to die. On Friday morning, the jailer came. In the early light, I could see. As he dragged two thieves away, he said, Barabbas, you can go free. The crowd outside was angry, and I could hear them roar, Barabbas, Barabbas, as the jailer unlocked my door. I made my way through the city gates, out to Mount Calvary. Instead of two crosses on that hill, I could see that there were three. Who's hanging there upon my cross, the one they built for me? Who's dying there in the middle, that Barabbas might go free? A purple robe, a crown of thorns, a face forgiving and kind. Nailed to the cross on Calvary, the cross that should have been mine. I lived 2,000 years ago, a sinner, friend like you. My name is Barabbas, but yours is Barabbas too. I am Barabbas, and so are you. We're all like him. Different Bible passages call him an insurrectionist, a murderer. Um, He fully deserved to be on that cross that day. 
the one that Jesus did not deserve to be on. But I propose to you today that we're all insurrectionists in our own way, and we all deserve our own cross. Romans 3.23 says that we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But just like Barabbas, we've all been given a free pass. Mine came on May 31, 1995. Jesus gave us a way to choose a different way, just like Barabbas had. That free pass is called God's grace. One definition for it is the unmerited favor of God. There's nothing we can do to earn that. It all goes back to John 3:16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life, have a free pass. Barabbas' name actually means is Bar Abba, which literally means son of the father, son of the master or teacher or rabbi. One Bible dictionary said is, says that his name means son of shame or confusion, but most point to the son of the father or teacher. How do you go from being the son of the father to being an insurrectionist? How do we go from being insurrectionist to being the son or daughter of the heavenly father? If you've asked Christ to be your savior, you too are the daughter or son of the father. You too have a free pass. We don't focus on what was before. We focus on the future. We don't know from the Bible what Barabbas did with his free pass. Was he grateful for the savior who died in his place? Did he devote his life to doing good instead of murdering and wreaking havoc and participating in insurrections? We can't know the answers to those questions, but we can know this. We can talk about what we will do with our free pass with our unmerited favor, with our free grace. What are you going to do with yours? None of us knows how many days and weeks and years we have remaining. What are we gonna do with that that Jesus has given us? C.S. Lewis says in The Problem of Pain, for you will certainly carry out God's purpose however you act, but it makes a difference whether you serve like Judas or like John. And now, that was the longest sermon introduction in the history of sermons. So I would like to tell you about being citizens of heaven. Thank you, Francisco. If you all don't know Francisco, you should know him because he makes everything happen. So um, I'm going to share some thoughts with you on how I think we can live well with our free pass of grace. In our Lakeside Institute of Theology class this semester, we've been um, talking about how to study the Bible. And we've kind of zeroed in on, we haven't kind of, we have zeroed in on the book of Philippians and done a very deep dive into the book of Philippians. And one verse just kept jumping out at me. It says, Philippians 1.27, above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Then whether I come and see you again, or only I hear about you, I know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. And I just kept s sitting in that, citizens of heaven, in a manner worthy of the good news of Christ. But what does citizens of heaven mean? Many of us in this room are expats here in Mexico. We are citizens of another country, but we have the privilege to be here in this one. So how do we live as citizens in two places? We know in the Bible that Abraham, God called Abraham out of his country to a land that he had never been and said, this will be your inheritance. And it, it tells us in Hebrews 11 that Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. And so are we. But back to Philippians, it talks about those who will be citizens of heaven and those who will not in Philippians 3. There are many whose conduct shows they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. They are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things, and they think only about this life here on earth. But we are citizens of heaven, where the Lord Jesus lives, and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. One of my seminary professors put it like this. We live in the already but the not yet. We are already citizens of heaven, but God still has us here for a reason. So we live in the not yet. Yes, this is, this is going to be our home at some point, whenever it is that God calls us there. But while we're still here, he has work for us to do, work that only you can do, work that only I can do, in the, with the gifts and the talents that he has given each of us. So we live in the already, already I am a citizen of heaven, already I am forever and ever and ever with Jesus Christ, but not yet. 
because I have things still to do here that the Lord is calling me to do. So the, the key verse says that we must live um, as citizens of heaven, conducting ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. So how do we do that? We don't have to work out our salvation. God gives us this free grace. I say that we, again, back to Philippians, look at chapter 2, where Paul tells us about the character of Christ that we can emulate. He says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others, too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. And what attitude did he have? Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of the God, God the Father. Sorry. He completely humbled himself. He served others. He took an interest in others, and he loved us, as Romans 5 tells us, he loved us when we were unlovable. And that's how we can know what love looks like, is how Christ lived and how Christ loved us and loves us every day. And I say to you that if we take on that form of humility like he did and love others like he does and look for opportunities to love others like he does, we will be walking in a manner worthy of the gospel as we are still citizens here on this earth, but eternally there forever. Um, I say that the, I won't read it again, but, but to me, these, these verses really tell us, give us a guideline for how to live. One of our students in the LIT class um, drew a circle on the board, and she put love in the center of the circle, and then she put all of these qualities of Christ coming out of the circle. But the main motivator was his, is his love for us. And our main motivator should be to show that love, just like that woman that I met that had something that I knew I didn't have, she had the love of God, and she was sharing it wherever she went, and I wanted to be like that. So Paul says it, and I don't have it on the screen for you, in 2 Thessalonians, so we keep on praying for you, asking our God to enable you to live a life worthy of his call. May he give you the power to accomplish all the good things your faith prompts you to do. Then the name of our Lord Jesus will be honored because of the way you live, and you will be honored along with him. This is all made possible because of the grace of our God and Lord Jesus Christ. And while it is all made possible because of the grace of Jesus Christ, um, Pastor Carolyn mentioned well ago the ladies who go and work in the prison. The good, they are doing the good things that their faith has prompted them to do. And so many of you in here have ministries that you do day in and day out and week in and week out. And God has given you the faith to do that and is prompting you to do that. And he is honored through your work, even when you don't see it. And even when you face distractions and hardships and trials. Because I'm telling you that as you attempt to put others first and attempt to humble yourself and live as a servant and love those around you, you're going to face distractions and hardships. Um, I've recently had some trouble with my eyes and have had to have a few procedures. I've had floaters all my life in my eyes, but in the past month they've become worse. And do you know what they've done? They've distorted my reality. What just went by in my peripheral vision? Was it a bug? Was it a floater? Was it Superman? Um, and the floaters and the procedures that I have had have caused me to lose focus as well because my eyes are so tired. It's so much harder to do my work that I do, which is on the computer, or to study, or to read. Um, it's been doubly hard to do lots of things. And so I've been somewhat distracted. I've been discouraged. Is this what it's going to be like? Is it going to get better? Is it going to get worse? Um, and as we attempt to serve Jesus, we will have challenges, and we will have discouragements, and we will have distortions. But Paul tells us that God's grace is sufficient. We must be seeking God daily for his reality, not what we see through our distorted eyes, but his reality. And we must recenter our purposes with his purposes, this, um, the good things that your faith prompts you to do, as it says in Thessalonians. And we must ask him to help us overcome the roadblocks that we're going to face. I have questions for you today that I'm not going to answer. Um, I'm going to let you all think about them, and I'm not going to read them all because 
I'm not. How do we live as citizens of heaven today? How do we love more? How do we prefer others? How do we show God's grace? How do we act like that woman did for me? Her name is Terry, by the way. She's a friend. And uh, how do we act like Terry did? Do, when people look at us, do they say, I want what he's got. I want what she's got. Or do they see us just living like everybody else and um, crabby and irritable and short-tempered? We won't talk about when we're driving because I don't think it counts then. And so um, I think that we have to answer these questions as we walk with him daily. Am I showing his love? And, and I've, um, I've recently moved um, over east of Chapala and I live near a church where they set off coetes. Um, and, um, but the church bells ring every hour. And I've been using those church bells as kind of a recentering. Okay, it's eight o'clock. Who do I need to pray for? Just kind of as a refocusing back where I need to be. What practices can you initiate like that? Um, and what if God wants us to use us to bear some of the burdens that people are suffering? We have no clue what people are going through. Even right here in this room, we have no idea of the hardships and the pain that people are facing. And also the joys and the celebrations. God wants us to be there for those as well. He wants us to walk with people and love people like he does. Um, I follow an account on Instagram called Sharon Says So. She's America's government teacher, and uh, I, I love her account, but she had this quote on there. It's not our job to fix everything, but it is our job to show up. Everyone doing something small is much better than a small number of people doing it all. My dad used to tell my kids when it was time to clean the house or whatever, he said, if everybody does a little, nobody has to do a lot. My kids hate that phrase. And so, uh, <laughs> but that is the truth. And in Texas, after this horrific mass murder again, I noticed that one group was providing food for the florists in town as well as for the funeral homes. That's not even something I would have thought of, but my goodness, think about those people. They need love, they need food, they need prayers. Somebody prompted somebody to do that. What is God prompting you to do? How is he prompting you to step out? What is your something small that God would have you to do? to accomplish all the good things that your faith prompts you to do. Don't be discouraged by thinking, I'm not doing anything. You have no idea how God will use and bless your obedience. Our youngest daughter goes to Mount Holyoke College in Western Massachusetts, founded by Mary Lyon in 1837 as the first university for women. Um, Miss Lyon had a mantra for all the women who, went, who graduated from Holyoke, and it's on her gravesite in the middle of the campus now. And it says, go where no one else will go and do what no one else will do. And I challenge you all to do that today. And if it's sitting in your home praying, then do that. Because not everybody has the physical capabilities to go to the prison like, like some of these people do. But we can all pray. We can all minister to others. We can all love each other. Um, and this is something that I pray over people. What divine appointments does God have for you today? What coincidences is God going to bring into your life, coincidences of people that you might encounter that you can minister to? So as I conclude... I'll say to you that we are all like Barabbas in the negative sense, but I would say that we are all like Barabbas in that we are sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father who've been a given a free pass to heaven. He walked past that cross on Mount Calvary, perhaps. We don't know what Barabbas did, but as we think on that cross, I want to challenge you all. How can you take what God has given to you and use it? If you haven't accepted that invitation of his salvation, of his free grace, of his free pass, today is that day. If you have, then today is the day to recommit to serving him the best that you can. You'll have floaters or distractions, but God will provide a way out of those so that you may be, serve him by loving his children, the ones in this church and the ones outside of this church. Will you go live that today? Will you go be his hands and feet, or his prayers, or his drink of water, or his food that he's called you to do? In whatever way you can, none of it is any better than any other. Show people his love. Show people his grace. Show people his mercy. They will remember it. I certainly did. Amen. Thank you, Jody. That was beautiful. Now as we prepare our tithes and offerings, let's pray together. Generous God, creator, redeemer, sustainer, at your table we present these gifts, the symbol of the work you've given us to do. Please use it and use us in the service of your world to the glory of your name, amen.
Let's all stand, please. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. seated, please. We now come to our time of communion, when we share together in the body and blood of Jesus in recognition of his great sacrifice for us. Here at Lakeside Presbyterian Church, we practice open communion. That means all baptized believers in Jesus Christ may share at this table. But of course, this is not to be taken lightly. As the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth about partaking in this communion, he said, is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the body, blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. Therefore, whoever eats the body or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. So now, as we prepare to come to the table of the Lord, let's confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Please pray with me. God, forgive us. Our communion is not always visible to the world. Sometimes we allow threats to unity to enter our church, making it hard to see that we are your community. We act as though we do not need each other. We do not always love one another. We do not know and bear one another's burdens. We fail to build each other up. We do not always give ourselves willingly and joyfully to one another. Forgive us and strengthen us so that we may live in the unity that you grant us. Forgive us now, Lord, as each of us in the silence of our hearts confess to you our own personal sins. In your great mercy, Lord, forgive us our sins, free us from selfishness, that we may choose your will and obey your commandments now and forever, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So now, by Christ's work, we are reconciled and united with God and with one another. Thanks be to God for the good news. Just a few words of instruction. After the words of institution, the ushers will release the rose from the back, Please come down the center aisle, and once you've received the elements, go back down the side aisles to return to your seat. If you're unable to come forward, we'll bring the elements to you immediately after others have been served. We do something a little different here than most churches. As a sign that we take this communion as a celebration of our personal relationship with Jesus, please eat the bread as you receive it. As a sign that we also share in this communion as the community that is the body of Christ, please take the cup back to your seat and we will all drink together after everyone has been served. Good morning. I trust everybody's doing good. I see some smiles, so that's not bad. Today I would like to open with two pertinent scriptures before communion. First, behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. You know that one, that's Revelation 3.20. The second one, then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And that comes from Jeremiah 
chapter 29, 12 through 14. In the beginning, God created us for himself, but even though we have fallen through our disobedience to sin and to death, God in his infinite mercy, grace, and love sent his only begotten son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to live among us. He suffered every hardship, every adversity, every trial and trouble and temptation that we face, except without sin. And finally, he stretched out his arms upon the cross in perfect obedience to the will of his Father and offered himself for the sins of the whole world. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And after he had blessed it, he said, Drink it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many, for the remission or for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Jesus said, I am the bread of life, and whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Therefore, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup in faith, we eat the very body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, proclaiming his death until he comes again. Would the ushers and the elders kindly come forward again? Thank you.
the gifts of God for the people of God. Take and feed on them in your hearts by faith and surely with thanksgiving. Let's as a congregation partake of the cup together. Let's pray. Lord, we are humbled by your grace for us that you would allow your body to be so violently abused and your blood to be poured out on behalf of all the people you created, that you would seek relationship with us even though we have not been faithful to you. Your sacrifice did more than just forgive. It conquered death and granted us freedom from sin. It has made us alive in Christ. We can now walk out each day in freedom from that which used to bind us. Help us to take off the blinders and recognize that we are free indeed. You are worthy of praise, Lord of freedom. Amen. Now let's stand for our final hymn. <laughs> Still my soul, the Lord is on your side. Bear patiently the cross of grief for pain. Leave to thy God to order and provide. In every change, he faithful will remain. Be still. Before I give the benediction, I want to remind you about coffee hour. Please go there and speak to Rebecca for one of those small things that you can do on behalf of somebody else today and uh, help Erica become released from prison. Our benediction today comes from Philippians, Philippians 1, verses 3 to 6. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Lord.